various um, anthologies, the latest being this one, which has papers on Pakistani writers uh, by um, national and international scholars, which was launched last month, uh, last week at the uh, international conference. I'm Salman Tariq Qureshi. I write poetry in English, also some short stories, and uh, I'm a newspaper columnist with uh, uh, the Daily Times, the Friday Times, and sometimes the Dawn, which is the habit I have, like many other people who live in Kaila in Karachi. Um, I've published a book of poems called um, uh, Landscapes of the Mind, and my editor, interestingly, was uh, Meenaza Shabsi here. <laughs> and, uh, Apart from that, I publish poetry and short stories various places around the world in different magazines and other publications. And modesty forbids me for saying anything more about myself in the absence of my uh, the moderator. So I'd rather wait uh, that the session starts and I will talk about the subject of the session later. I think, Misa, you will read off? Lead off? Do you want me to talk about him? Uh, well, let me talk to you a little about Adam Zamin Zad. Um, I had mentioned earlier that he, he actually grew up here. And um, he went, well, I'll tell you a little about his life and times. I had done an interview of him about uh, 1990. And um, his, his parents had actually, uh, I think they had actually married um, against the wishes of their respective families. So they lived in um, Nairobi for many years. Um, where they both became teachers. They both belonged to Pakistan. And Adam grew up with a great love for Africa. And in Nairobi, he had a, um, a black nanny. And through him, he, he learned, uh, he, be, he became very close to him. And he um, learned a lot about th that world and, uh, and Africa. And that would later be transmuted into his novel, My Friend Matt and Henna the Whore, which is actually set and inspired by the Ethiopian famine. And he gave the funds to famine relief. That was his second novel. But anyway, after Africa, at, at, uh, when he's about eight or nine, um, his father inherited some land that became a Punjabi landlord in the Sindh. So, and the parents split up, and Adam went and lived uh, with his um, father for a while where he was obviously had a lot of problems. He said he, he couldn't stand school, he used to run away from school. Um, I think he, he, he was always reading, he was, always, he was obviously very intelligent. And his, um, his uh, and, and he was always running away, he said he was always running away from, uh, he would jump over the walls of his father's haveli and go and fraternize with the people living, the workers and the, and the peasants working nearby. And he came to know the um, poorer people of the area. And that, again, you see this, uh, this theme of the rich boy um, finding greater uh, comfort among, among the poorer people. Um, it runs through his work. Anyway, at some point, he then moves to Lahore and comes and lives with his mother. And um, I think that was also a period of great hardship because what he said to me was he saw um, it was a life of um, increasing poverty, he says. And I saw... Hello, Framji. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Hmm? Oh. Well, yes, yes Framji, meanwhile, I, 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 I was just telling them the life of Adam Zamizad. So, okay. I'll just, just finish on that. So then he came, he came and lived here with his mother, and the, uh, obviously there was sort of great financial hardship, and he said he saw the power of poverty to demean and degrade. He saw that, and he otherwise, in that interview with me, he also talked about going for walks in Lawrence Gardens and about the trees and the crows and the birds. And then he said to me at the end of that, he said, and I would never exchange my uh, childhood in Pakistan for any other because it was such a diverse, rich world that I inhabited. He ha also had relatives who taught him Gurmurki. I think he was interested in Persian. I mean, he was... And then he went to government college and then... Uh, Karachi University taught at FC College and then he migrated after his mother died in a car accident. That's when he left and then I think he traveled 
And finally, there was a teacher shortage in England and he was offered a job. And that's where he settled. And he, I, I'm not sure at what point in all this he was married before or after. He never really spoke about his uh, family life in that way. And he never actually told me his real name. And this is Framji Meanwhile. Uh, my apologies, the roads are all blocked and he took me to the house. You need a, you need, you ah. need. Yes? Great. Um, I thought I would just begin by reading something that he, uh, Adam Zamindar Zad wrote on his own website, uh, which gives uh, an overview of his themes and the ideas that he wanted to inject into his novels, his concerns, his, his uh, passions about the world in which he lived. Um, says, um, I tend to portray the lives of social outcasts, loners, losers, the deprived and the dispossessed. I aim to give voice to the voiceless, reshape and reform those distorted by time and circumstance, embrace the rejects of this world, dignify trash, white, tinted or tainted, and make visible the invisible. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists in their readings of his work, where do you see, um, in which novels do you see these ideas come to fruition? Um, how does he weave them into his work? His, um, especially Cyrus Cyrus, I think, is the, the, the big novel, um, his fourth novel, um, the one that received great acclaim and also really bad reviews. <laughs> so, uh, may may I uh, place him in some perspective? Because uh, he's little known uh, outside the cognoscenti. And uh, while lots of people know about Zulfkagos' novel, the murder of Aziz Khan, which he wrote and published in England in 1967. Um, uh, and then you had Tariq Mahmood writing Hand on the Sun in 1983. And Babsi had written Crow Eaters in 1978, and The Bride in 1984, Ice Candy Man 1985. Zamin Zala is actually his pen name, his nom de plume. Uh, his real name was Salim Ahmed. And uh, his first novel, The Thirteenth House, he wrote six novels, as Maniza has just pointed out, uh, was uh, published in 1987. So it's almost following Zulfkar Ghos, following Tarek Mahmood, and following Babsi that you have this new voice of Pakistani writers. Um, this particular novel, if I may briefly um, go through it, is set in Pakistan in the early Zia years. So um, as Framji has pointed out, although he uh, talks about the poor and the dispossessed, he places uh, those characters within the period of Zia's regime. And uh, it, was, uh, it won the David Hyam Prize for the best debut novel. So you can see that a lot of promise was attached to his work, uh, his first uh, publication. The novel is narrated by Zahid, a poor clerk with a handicapped son and all the travails and tribulations which uh, the poor uh, have to face in a state of poverty and uh, dispossession. And the interesting thing, unlike the other novelists, uh, I've mentioned um, Zulfkar Ghos and Tariq Mahmood and Babsi, who wrote in the realistic tradition by and large, those early novels. His is a mix of the realistic and the surreal, uh, which may, uh, I, I won't call it spiritual, uh, all the spirits in it, but it's the surreal, it's slightly off. It's not a s uplifting spirituality. It's a, a demeaning and a, a, a restricting uh, spirituality. And therefore it has that surreal quality which the other uh, novels by the other writers do not have. And then he talks also about, in the first novel, about religious exploitation. You know, under Zia, there was this great fervor of Islamization. And he looks at it from a different viewpoint, which is refreshing uh, since uh, very little got written and printed in Pakistan about that regime. A lot of it was done later or it was uh, published abroad. And there is a sense of comedy as well. It's not all doer and it's not all sad and bitter uh, that uh, you see in his novels, but it, there's an element of black comedy, a humor there, which underlines all this uh, exploitation, all this um, suffering that the characters have to undergo. And um, in the end, the narrator dies. And, uh, it, and yet he's relating this whole story like uh, an omniscient uh, 
presence, uh, a person who is uh, aware of the other side of the coin and is able to give you uh, a different viewpoint on the uh, contemporary situation of that period. Um, can I read the this, this sort of epigraph he wrote for the 13th house, which I think might give a sense of uh, his interests and concerns. Uh, in our own different ways and by our own different routes and from our own different places, Zahid, the narrator of the 13th house, or the, this protagonist, and I have both broken through the circle of destiny and moved out of the 12 houses of spasmodic pleasure into the 13th house, the house of perpetual pain and therefore no pain, the house of perpetual darkness and therefore no darkness, the house of perpetual despair and therefore no despair. Here we shall remain like millions of others through the centuries from many different houses and many different lands until man can build a house on earth that can be a home for all, a comforting, welcoming house made with the bricks of love, designed not by philosophers but gypsies, built not by politicians but children, blessed not by priests but clowns. Um, Okay, but now <laughs> most of us have been talking about the 13th house as, uh, and of course, as his um, typical work. It was his first work, and uh, Cyrus Cyrus is probably, well, it's a huge work, so that's, uh, we can take a separately talk about that. To me, though, the most typical work in a different kind of context was Love, Bones, and Water, uh, where, well, it takes place on an imaginary island, uh, imaginary country somewhere uh, near Mexico or wherever, and where it's involved with politics, but the politics are entirely surreal. Um, unreal, surreal, it's difficult to say what. Um, typical of him, I would put this, uh, yeah, the opening lines of Love, Burns and Water. This was his third novel. Hmm? This third. was third novel. His third, yes. third novel, yeah. Uh, the opening lines of Love, Bones, and Water <coughs> are like this. The night, was beginning, the night was beginning to expel the new day from, the womb, from her womb. The lower parts of the horizon were drenched with blood. The man, the whoever, the guy, the man lay curled up on the beach like a grotesque ball with the air booted out. The quivering shoreline skirted uncertainly around him, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He was naked, except for a black hood over his head and his face. His penis had been crudely carved out. So had his tongue. His buttocks had been fire-branded, his nipples razor-slashed. To look at him, you would have thought he was dead. He's not dead. Now, this kind of very sanguinary preoccupation with extreme violence and extreme uh, torture. I mean, I'd see it as, uh, if I were to look at it, I'd see it someone who had perhaps got to, who'd lived through the, although he hadn't lived through the horrors of the Ziaul Haq years and of the Karachi in the 1990s. Um, but they are typ not typical of other writers of that time or who would have uh, been contemporaries of Zamin Zad. So these preoccupations of his grow from, I think, his basic obsession with being the outsider, being not there, not part of anything, and a life of constant pain himself, so he transfers that pain onto this character who plays a very important role in the novel, which I may talk about later if I get the chance. Yes, yes, I think that's true, but I think this theme of being dispossessed, of being the other, um, I think it runs through all his novels. Um, yes, it, well, there's 13th House, and then th this, the, this one, which is actually one of my favorites. I, I was talking about it, my friend ha Henna and ha uh, Matt the Hall. I'm not, Matt yes, and Henna the My Hall. friend Matt and Henna the Hall. It's, um, he, he, he said this at the time of famine. And when you say he's got humor, he, he has this humor, but he, it's accentuated by the fact that his characters or his narrators are either children 
or they have a kind of wide-eyed, childlike innocence about the world. So they see things which are actually not very funny, but to them they seem very peculiar. And this, um, this book, I, I mean, the Ethiopian family, these children running away from home because there, there's no food. The, and you, you, you see the grandmother, I mean, what, what, what he's entranced by is it, grandmother's forming this great spirit dance. And that's where you get his merging with the real and the surreal among people such as the tribes that he describes, where the surreal actually exists as, as real. And while all this is happening, um, you hear the sound, they hear the sound of planes and bombers flying overhead. And one of the things um, that comes through in this book and also in Cyrus Cyrus, which Cyrus, um, I have to explain a little bit, Cyrus is a Chura. He's born, born an untouchable, he's born in India, he's a Chura. And they convert to Christianity and he gets educated. But then there's a crime somewhere for which he is blamed. So he and his entire family have to uh, flee. They flee where? They go to East Pakistan and just before the 1971 war. And then there's the flood. Uh, and in the flood, like in, in my friend Matt the Hen of the Hall, you've got the uh, natural famine. And then you've got all these guns and people committing atrocities on each other. And in uh, Cyrus Cyrus, you have uh, the floods, and someone gets eaten by a, bit by a snake and dies, and someone's eaten by a crocodile, and someone's attacked by a tiger and dies, and all these awful things. But none of that compares to the absolute horror of what people do to each other. You know, the way the, most of Cyrus's family dies because someone comes and commits terrible atrocities. Um, so that, that is another theme that is very, very, very common in all his books. Um, I think, again, in, 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 the, in, in, uh, in Love, Bones and Water, you've got a volcano about to go up, you've got this, but nothing compares to this man who's been tortured and had these terrible things done to him. And, um, yeah. where was and, Sire? You know, yeah. and also, I think, I think perhaps the, the, the novels are more poignant and also more horrifying because so much of the, the horror is inflicted on children, yes, on, yes. on children yeah. who are dispossessed, who have no home, who have been uprooted. Uh, in uh, my friend Matt and Hina the Whore, uh, the central, the, narr the narrator is a 10 year old boy named Kimo who accompanies Matt and Hina on a kind of, uh, not even really a walkabout. It begins as a walkabout and then it becomes an, uh, a, a, a journey to find food, to, to stave off starvation really. Um, uh, and it's, it's sort of the horrifying effects of the world we live in <laughs> on the most vulnerable of us um, that the novels tend to portray and um, tend, to, uh, tend to show us. And a world that I would say not sugar-coated at all. There, there is very little redeeming about the world that, uh, that Zeminzad portrays in his novels. And would you agree? Um, uh, I think you have a point there. I'll just take up uh, where Manisa left. Uh, this is Cyrus Cyrus that she was talking about, which is considered his big novel. Uh, it's, it's a classic, the form is a classic confession. You confess something and you write about what you've done. And Cyrus himself is a murderer of three children, two of his own and a third one. So you can see how dark the personality already is. It's already marked. It's already uh, aware of what it's done, the atrocity it has perpetuated. And then it's also a picaresque novel, in the sense that just like Tom Jones or Handy uh, Fielding's um, other novel called um, Joseph Andrews, or Cervantes' famous Don Quixote, or as the English like to call it, Don Quixote, they were all about the protagonist traveling, journeying, and talking about his experiences. A similar sort of thing is noticed here. The structure is very picaresque. He travels from place to place. He uh, gives his impressions. He interacts with the people. And uh, you begin to see the sort of person that he is very gradually. You begin to uh, unravel uh, the horrible person, the horrifying personality that he possesses. So in that way, um, as Framji was saying, it's something that runs through all his novels. There's a very strong, dark streak in the way he conceives reality and the way he mixes reality with the surreal 
and the way he fantasizes about things while commenting on real issues like politics, like society, like poverty, exploitation of children, murder, famine. So it's, it's, it's a very different way of writing from say Zulfikar Ghosh or Babsi Sidwa or uh, um, Tariq Mahmood, his contemporaries at that time. But you, you talk about redemption, I'd like to pick that up because you see actually what I found um, reading his books, they are very deeply rooted in the Christian concept of redemption through suffering. The, the gray man, he, he becomes a kind of Christ-like figure in, 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 in Love, Bones, and Water. And all the people in that um, book have biblical names. The boy is called Peter. I think there's a woman called Magda. Um, I think there's a Matthew. They're all biblical names. That's more obvious. Even in Cyrus, Cyrus, um, that, that, that Christianity, the, the, uh, it, it comes through very, very strongly. Um, the other one, which is rather interesting, <coughs> uh, it's not quite a redemption, uh, because in Cyrus Cyrus, you know, he flees from, um, he goes from India to East Pakistan to America to England, you know, this long sort of um, journey, in, and where, of course, one of the things he also discusses is the uh, problem of color, of race, of being of being accused of crimes that you haven't committed because you are supposed to do them because of the color of your skin or because you are a foreigner, which in a way is kind of topical these days, um, although this was written in 1991. But in the fifth novel, um, what is the- Gorgeous the, White Female. Gorgeous, gorgeous white, white Female. female. That is, a, I, I, I was very fascinated by it. It's the only uh, Pakistani English novel which deals with um, gender issues, transgender. This boy um, wants to be a female. And, and, and what he does, the book uh, plays on two things. And he's a British born boy. So it plays, and then he goes and stays with his grandmother, his traditional Hindu grandmother in um, New York. And it plays on the legend of Kali. What the Kali is, is in Indian, Indian culture, she is, a, she, she, is, she is a goddess. She has fearful aspects, but she has beneficial aspects. And into that, he links the British concept of Kali, where you're supposed to be committing sacrifices in front of her. And he gets into his head that he has to go and sacrifice someone in front of the goddess in his grandmother's basement. And, you know, in order to resolve his own problems. And again, it looks at the mythology of colonialism and the mythology of film, because this boy's mother is white and blonde. He calls her Marilyn. Uh, we don't know whether they're anyone's. Her mother is Marilyn, and father is Raj, and father is dark and Indian, and he's Raj. And he wants to be Marilyn. He doesn't want to be Raj. And it's the most beautifully done book, I thought. And he leaves it an ambiguous end, but the point is in that end. Um, I don't want to give away the book, the, but redemption has a kind of, if you don't commit the crime, it has a sort of rather ambiguous end. I, I don't want to spoil the end of the book if you does, can get Does one it. see, do you think, in that um, redemption, suffering, followed by redemption, um, the Christian uh, uh, myth, certainly, but also perhaps a life of suffering of his own. He's a displaced person all his life. Yes. He has no roots anywhere. He, the African, he's in Karachi, he's in Lahore, he's in Canada, he's in America, he is everywhere. And he seems to have had a very disturbed childhood with his parents and so on. So would that be, um, is that uh, perhaps his own inner demons, where one doesn't know what they were. I think it's worth noting also that he began his novel career as late as 1987, he's born in 1937. He's 50 years old when he publishes his first novel. What he wrote in between, I don't know, uh, but I'm not aware of it. He was teaching Others English. Others may be aware. <laughs> <It's> teaching English. <laughs> yeah. Well, his novels followed in very quick succession, don't they? I mean, he starts off in 1987, and by 1991, he's written his fourth novel. Yes. You know, so maybe he was... And his fifth novel comes in 1995, and his last novel takes a bit longer. Huh. Uh, Pepsi and Maria comes oh, in 2004. Yes, so, that's a, yeah. yes. so um, it is rapid, and then there is a big break. 
But the interesting thing which I'd like to point out is, is locations. He starts the first novel with uh, Pakistan, and then he goes on with a second novel to Africa, yeah. Ethiopia, and with the third novel he goes off to Mexico, uh, South America. Yeah, mm -hmm. they don't specify the country, but no, no, South, uh, South like American that, yeah. country. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Cyrus, Cyrus, he's all over the place in the picturesque tradition. And then he comes back to uh, UK and USA in his fifth novel, Gorgeous White Female. Uh, in which the character's father is Bengali and mother is English. And then the, uh, the last novel which he writes, Pepsi and Maria, is again based in South America. So you can see the range of his canvas, that he's looking at various continents, as it were, rather than countries, Asia and Africa and South America and North America. And therefore, trying to find common strands within those continents of characters and of issues and of concerns and of things that uh, somehow are palpable to him and which move him to write the way he does. Let me tell you that, as Premji read a passage in so did uh, Saman, it's very lyrical writing, if you uh, look at it. Despite very its nice you know, brooding mood, it has great passages of beauty in it. And you begin to see his command of the English language. And being a teacher, as uh, she, Manisa pointed out, he taught English for several years in a uh, private school in south of England, uh, you can see that element coming out, that is sensitivity to the word rather than just a straightforward, um, uh, strong, um, structured, strong, charactered uh, novel. It's also the beauty of the language which comes across. I think one of them is being developed into a graphic novel. I mean, before he died, he died, died in December. I think before he died, he had approved. I think it's Pepsi and Maria. One of these Pepsi books and Maria. is becoming yeah. a graphic novel, yes. Yeah. So, so it should be out quite soon. I thought I would read uh, a, a little passage from an interview that he gave uh, about Cyrus Cyrus, uh, which, uh, which, which, has a, which I have a question about um, to all of you. Uh, he says, in my novel Cyrus Cyrus, I became obsessed with the idea that birth is the wage of sin. Um, Using that premise as a starting point, I constructed the story of an untouchable caste Indian Christian boy whose process of growing up involves a journey through three continents, then death and descent into Hades with the possibility of rebirth. My attempt was to present the whole passage from living to dying and end with Shiva's dance of death, which could result in the recreation of this world in another and different form. In the book, I appear to be all for global warming and environmental damages which might bring about the immediate destruction of this unjust world and make it possible for a new and better universe with intellectually, morally superior life forms to emerge. But this idea that birth is the wage of sin, right, uh, which, which is actually a theme that harks back to a Greek tragedy, right, that best not to have been born or count no man happy until he is free of pain. Um, this idea that, in fact, living itself is the problem. <laughs> um, uh, do you see that as uh, uh, th threaded through the work itself? That is best to be dead. <laughs> You're quite right. In degree tra tragedies, one does see this aspect, Oedipus, Rex, and Sophocles, and Euripides, and uh, a whole lot of uh, Greek uh, um, plays that one reads and which had a profound influence on um, European drama as such. Uh, it is an element there, but uh, the beauty of um, uh, Zamizad is that how beautifully he has been able to embed it without making it obvious. Yeah. And that, I think, is a uh, real craftsmanship. If you look at Shakespeare, Shakespeare's plays, they were mostly borrowed. I think he only wrote one or two plays which were original. The rest were themes that he had taken from other people, taken from other dramatists, and yet he transformed them in such a way that you don't bother about the precedence. You just think about Shakespeare. I think this is the quality in Zaminzad, that he, of course, like all writers, borrows and takes from other people. But unless you're able to transform it into something original, something you can say is my own, because the issues of humanity are the same. They always have been. Life and death, struggle, you know, ever since um, drama was written, or Homer's um, Odyssey, or whatever. The issues are the same, but it's the way you transform them and make them immediate to the uh, reader that uh, is Zameen Zad's uh, contribution to Pakistani literature in English. No, he, he I'm also going to comment writer. for a moment. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. No, I'm just saying uh, it's a very remarkable yeah. Please go ahead. 
that's all. Um, no, I'm only uh, going to comment for a moment on the, his style of writing. Um, it's clumsy in parts, there's no question about that. Uh, there are times I feel that he's uh, um, over laboring his but as even when he's describing the ugliest of scenes as, say, the ones I read out and others that Pamji's read out, uh, his, he's a lyrical writer. His prose is pure lyricism. Mm. All the way, every time, there are no flat passages, flat prosaic passages in uh, Zaminzad novel. It doesn't make for easy reading, but it makes for a really wonderful journey through uh, a book. Now, in a sense, he is writing to, it seems almost to me that he's writing to purge himself of his own pain. And that's where the lyricism is coming from. That's my subjective view. Others may, the more. No, no I think you're right. I mean, I think he had a difficult life and that, that there was all this that he was trying, he, he was trying to resolve. Uh, but he, you know, the, the other thing is you know, this thing about crossing continents and but he does find bits and pieces. I mean, you know, bits and pieces of, again, love bulbs and water set in South America. I think there's a plan to, by, the, um, by the government to mow down a, an entire community. There are people living in the shanty town. They're going to build it. The plan is to mow down the shanty community, the shanty town, and then build this shining new um, blocks of flats. And that, that's so much like life in Karachi, you know, they're always wanting to mow down somebody or the other. And um, that, that those kind of things, they, they seep across different continents um, in all his books. There is a common thread. Yes. Um, would you like to read a passage? Oh, yeah. Which one? Well, I was thinking this one. Which one is, uh, which one is that? From Cyrus Harris, just to give a sense of the, the flow and yeah, yeah. Uh, up to about the, the meal and the food and the huh? Uh, when oh mine, when all had quietened down in an eerie sort of unresolve, we all went to the big boat for our meal. After being made to swear that not one word of this unnatural occurrence was to be breathed to the gypsy family. It may well have had something to do with gypsy magic, in which case the less said the better or worse things could happen. That was considered corporate conclusion. The special dish that night was shabdeg, a true connoisseur's dish, a Kashmiri speciality requiring slow overnight cooking Hence the name Shab, meaning night, and Deg, meaning a large pot, usually earthenware. Its main ingredients are diced leg of beef and turnips, and it is eaten with generous helping of plain rice. I had had it only once before and longed to have it again. Even dear Nazri, so anxious always to show her disdain for mundane activities, such as eating and sleeping, was having difficulty not letting her drools drip. Greedily and eagerly, I sought out the largest piece of meat that I could find and swooped it up with one resolute motion of my fingers and shoved it into my wide open gob. This is brilliant, isn't it? But you know, the, the moving from, uh, moving from the particularity, the specificity, and the concrete description, and finding a way to express that concrete description, and then moving out back into the abstract when he... Um, did you get to the bit about um, the meat and I can taste my own flesh? No, that I didn't. I got as uh, far as the gob. I didn't realize uh, you wanted me to uh, No, 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 that's fine. Uh, but then he gets to this moment... Uh, I can't find it again. Um, he gets to this moment where he actually, by, when he's eating the dish, he can actually taste his own flesh. Um, and he describes what it's like to taste his own flesh and then how disgusted he is with himself, after which he goes to the side of the boat and vomits. <laughs> um, so, you know, it moves from um, a really lyrical passages to beautifully concrete descriptive passages to the grotesque. Um, and, and I think this is a strategy he uses in all of his, all the passages, you know, the, the little bits and pieces that I have read of his work. Um, that that it, it's a bringing together of the grotesque in a surreal context with the concrete in a really grounded real context and the juxtaposition of those that make his novels 
um, so different from other kinds of social realist Pakistani writing? Um, so. uh, if I may just take up what Framji was saying, he was talking about uh, the elements of Greek tragedy. Uh, in Cyrus Cyrus especially, uh, you also see Dante's vision of hell. You know, uh, yeah. if you read the Divine Comedy and it has three parts, the hell, heaven, and purgatory, uh, it's the hell aspect which becomes a motif in uh, Cyrus Cyrus because everything is grotesque and everything is the evil and everything has that quality of deserving hell. And uh, it, 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 it's these subtle uh, embedded uh, patterns which you see in his work that if you're aware of the um, European tradition uh, of uh, various genres, you begin to see how cleverly he is uh, embracing them without really making it very obvious. So in Cyrus Cyrus especially, this whole idea of hell, of um, the, the grotesque, as it were, uh, the surreal, and it's almost like uh, Hieronymus Bosch's vision of uh, hell. You have all sorts of things happening there which uh, startle you and which you re react to and which you uh, are startled by. And uh, that, that, I think, is uh, something which is quite unique to his work, that he's able to evoke this emotion um, evoke this uh, graphic uh, description of uh, things which get that required response. And one last word which I'd like to put in Framji before, uh, before I finish is that don't take the author's word as the last word. He may be saying something uh, which you as readers would and should um, um, respond to in your own way. Because what he's saying is what he intended to do, whether it was successful or not, is for you and me to decide. So whenever I read uh, any work, uh, novel or play, or, it's never take the word of the playwright or the novelist, because what he had to say, he has said it in the novel. And if he's explaining the novel, as unfortunately a lot of us tend to do, we try to explain our works. You go to NCA and you see this painting, Shirazad is sitting here. And then you ask the student to explain what he's doing. What he had to say, he said it. It's up to you now to see whether it was successful or not. So please be very sure that uh, when you read his novel, it's your response which is important. What he had to say, he has said it. And so have I. <laughs> um, we have about 10 minutes. Should we open for questions? Open it? Yes, I think we should definitely open for questions. up a little, I'm sorry. Name your favorite novel. Or is there a mic? <laughs> sorry? Name your favorite uh, Zaminzad novel. Of uh, Zaminzad? Yeah. Uh, I, I think I already did, Perhaps. Love Burns and Water. Although Cyrus Cyrus is possibly <coughs> his uh, best known work and uh, certainly the most, um, his, uh, the greatest sweep and extent is of that, but mine was personally was Love, Bones and Water, which I thought expressed the kind of grotesqueness and um, uh, the isolation that characterized Zamindad. I think for me it was uh, Matt, my friend, and another boy, because he's looking at uh, the world through his childlike eyes, sensitivity, the sensibility that is has that um, I'm a bit undecided. Uh, I want to point out, by the way, by the way, Cyrus Cyrus was long listed for the uh, Man Booker Prize. No, it wasn't Man Booker, it was a Booker Prize in those days. But we didn't really know much about the Booker Prize in those days, so it never got any uh, lift or publicity in Pakistan, which was really sad. Um, I, I would go for um, Matt. Uh, my friend Matt also, I mean, it, it is very lyrical and the, this whole world, the children and the combination of the spirit world and the belief in the spirit world, you know, it, it, because it's through a child and um, his, his 
sort of half understanding of what is happening and what is not happening. It's beautifully done. I think I would go, I would actually cheat and go for two. I think I'd go for Matt. I think I, I, I'd like a gorgeous white female also. I think that is a very fascinating book. Um, this, this confu A, the confusion of gender, and with that you get the confusion of color, you get the confusion of identity, um, you get the confusion of history. Um, I think it's beautifully done, the way he, he creates these divides and how they overlap. I haven't read Gorgeous about Females, but I comment. No, not, that, that, well, he, he sent it to me, and I couldn't find it anywhere, actually. Which? Uh, this the one? singular white female. Uh, gorgeous white female. Uh, uh, gorgeous white female. Yeah. I keep getting the name wrong. Uh, uh, he, he was very nice. He sent it to me. Um, many of the books are out of print, so they are very difficult to get your hands on. But used booksellers in the UK and the US um, do have them. I have been unable, these are all Auntie Munizas actually, I have been unable to find a single copy of any of his novels in Karachi. Like not one used bookstore, not at Liberty, not nowhere. Um, which is really unfortunate, actually. And, and they are, um, I believe they're going to bring out, the publisher says they're bringing out new editions after this um, graphic novel, so let's see. Mike, please. His life, it's so fascinating. It seems to be a typical story of somebody who is misunderstood, or not understood, rather, during his own time, and he's discovered. And it seems to me that he just died this last December. December. And it is, uh, uh, seems very unfortunate <laughs> that, you know, he should be yeah, utilized at this time. Um, do you think something can be done to publish his works all together? Maybe, you know, Tahir Sahab and... I mean, Could publisher to do a Pakistani yeah. edition? That well, his be. agent would have to, you know... Well, I mean, I... Uh, Are there yes. any publishers here his, in the room? Well, yeah. his, his, he, he does have an agent and he does have a publisher in England who has uh, been trying to push his books. I think it's an agent, actually. Sustin. Sustin, that's right. Yeah, Sustin Agency, yeah. Just want to thank everybody for you know bringing it to uh, us as an audience, and uh, uh, I th I think that with all the new realism of its time, he seems to be pioneering in a lot of ways. He Man was, yes. style, and uh, you know, I mean, Garcia even. In that I mean, sense. no one from Pakistan was writing quite these kind of things at yeah. that time, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And please read Tariq Mahmood because he did this novel um, in the early 80s about Bradford and about immigrants. And he's now, after almost 20 or 30 years, started rewriting. Yeah. So look him up. Okay. Uh, this is Tariq you know? Mahmood? Uh, Tariq Mahmood. Yeah. I mean, the really unfortunate so thing is that Zaminza came to writing so late in his life. Um, so uh, this is from, from another interview. The list of books that he was working on uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, a fictional examination of one aspect of Van Gogh's life. A child's journey in an unnamed island to search for Mother Mary after he is told that she knows where his parents are. A study of the life of a third generation Muslim living in the UK in the context of terrorism. A personal non-fictional perspective on the world today. And occasionally, uh, uh, the odd poem that forces its way into consciousness and onto paper. Those were the things he was working on while. So, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a slew of unfinished manuscripts I, that. I, I, um, I, yeah, I, th I, think, I think there is, I think there is a no no novel on the pipeline that he did finish. I'm not 100% sure, but I think, or oh, maybe uh, there's all this stuff lying there and they'll be start. Uh, Yes, yes, I there. think so. Yes. I, I, I read. No, he, he felt. You see, he, the reason why I, I didn't know why he had stopped writing, I couldn't understand. And it was when I read his obituary in The Guardian, I found that he had had an accident. He'd had a bad car accident in the mid 90s. And that is what um, uh, that, that sort of uh, stopped or impeded his writing. He didn't do much after that. He has got children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, none of which he never, you know. There was, I know, an American academic who decided this is a, um, this is a pseudonym. Adam Zameen is not a real, so he got after him and wanted to know his real name. Now, whether the chap wrote him um, impolite letters, I don't know, but he just wouldn't answer. <laughs> so, you know, um, 
I don't know whether he was hiding it or whether he just felt it was irrelevant. I don't know. Uh, but you see, why Adam Zamidad? Adam means Adam, man. And Zamidad, a person who belongs to this earth. So that sort of connection with the earth permeates all his novels. It's well, the poor, it's the downtrodden. He's rooted in them, even as he's uh, talking about the rich and the famous. Well, this uh, Cyrus, Cyrus is actually a, a long dictation to Adam Zamidad, the man, son of earth. And the. Um, and the epigraph begins, offered in utmost reverence to Father O'Neill with deep gratitude for the peace he poured into my soul and the lust he roused in my body. <laughs> and to Adam Zaminzad, he will be changing the world as soon as possible, but he, no, yes, he will be changing the world as soon as possible, but he means well. <laughs> it's kind of rather lovely. Um, this is uh, right at the end. He does this. I just wanted to ask one thing. Uh, Contact Casey, Kinnate College, for uh, purchase of this anthology. Uh, actually, the question was, you know, more than others directed to Ma'am uh, uh, Muniza. Uh, uh, Ma'am Muniza, Ma'am, uh, in your uh, introduction to the writer, you you know talked about his childhood. Yes. His childhood uh, and his uh, experiences in the that you know uh, Lawrence Garden, uh, all that beautiful childhood, which you talked of, about, that he did not want to be placed with any others. And then uh, you know, in addition to that, uh, you know, the, the the amount of introduction that has come to us, I haven't seen that he was, you know, having any kind of economic problems or things like that in his childhood or while he was growing up. Uh -huh. So don't you think that there is, you know, this obvious pretentiousness of showing or portraying the world more bleak? or, you know, uh, more painful than he actually had, a, you know, kind of life he had. I mean, there is this amount of pretentiousness, I've been feeling like that. Because, you know, you said that he had a childhood which he did not want to replace with anything else. And then there was no economic worries and things like that. So how do you, you know, relate this, you know, that much pain and dispossession and all that with his life? Well, he was very aware of the dispossessed and of pain. I mean, he was, um, for one thing, as a child, he was always running out and he was uh, mixing with the poor tenants. And all he would have been aware of, of the exploitation they suffered. I mean, it's not possibly, and then he, as he, and he also writes in Lahore, where obviously there was money was running out. So he was aware of these kind of, um, dis but I mean, there is, no, really accounting, the people don't necessarily write about, I don't think he's writing about himself. I think he's writing about maybe some of his own pain, some of his awareness. It gets transmuted into living characters, into situations. Uh, a book, in a way, this is what they were discussing earlier, it's a part of, of an inner self. And it's that which emerges. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yes? No. No, it doesn't answer it. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, of course we have to admit that we, we really don't know much about his work, but the, you know, the introduction that came to me, I was feeling, you know, I was a bit confused that, you know, was there this pretentious effort to show the world like that? Oh, a no, kind no, of pretentiousness. No, so I don't think it was I pretentious. Was I think it, it was just his, um, it, it was just his um, perception of the world, of how he saw it of an, uh, and what he wanted to talk about. He didn't want to talk about people who were comfortable. In, in other words, it was a leap of imagination also. Yes, say. of course. <laughs> it was, well, well, it is and it isn't. If, uh, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's the, well, if you take the, um, I mean, that's why I've been very fascinated actually by the uh, links with Christianity in his novels. Um, I don't know, it, 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 you have to look at the whole Christian, if you take the Christianity thing, it, whether the whole Christian concept of redemption through suffering is um, pessimistic or not. I mean, we don't have that concept in our faith, but that is central to the Christian faith. I don't know whether, um, and I think his redemption, there is redemption at the end, but the redemption is the suff because you have suffered, because you have endured, because you have felt, you are no longer sort of insensitive, you are no longer all those terrible things. 
that uh, human beings are, and you have the possibility to pass on to a better world. That, that's how I read it. And I think the gray man... Uh, uh, the gray man, yes. Yeah. He well, is uh, a messiah figure. He's, he's, he's a messiah. He's, he is the gray man who suffered in that uh, Tariq described. He is, he is a kind of messiah figure because he then goes and lives with, in the, 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 that shanty town. And, but, and it's, it's, but it's not just the Christian, uh, Christian iconography and Christian narrative. It's as much... Um, I, I, there is in Cyrus Cyrus, of course, what he talks about, Shiva's dance of death, and that he wanted to actually right. structure yes, the narrative right. that way. Yes. Gorgeous white female, he makes a pact with Kavi, yes. right, and then cons uh, consistently murders people in order to achieve his ideal yeah. or dream. But he gets, um, yes, but he gets the it. African narrative. Um, my friend Matt Nina the Whore yes. uses um, African folklore and African Absolutely. mythology to actually counterpoise with the Christian iconography. So, right, um, so it's not that he's using one religious or ethnic context in which to structure his characters or his novels. They are, they, they are eclectic in that yes, way. Yes, well, in the same way that continents yeah. and everything overlap. Yes, yes right. he sees these kind of... He's an interesting... Um, it's a really interesting novelist. Yeah. I think, are we at time? Um, we have time for one more question, I think. First of all, thank you very much for such an enlightening conversation. And um, my question is that, did you, um, did you feel that he had a rebellious streak within him? Like from the paragraph that Sir uh, read to us, the descriptions he, he gave and the, and the concept he replayed, that, that what I think is that mostly people, especially during those years, the Pakistani people would culturally shy away from such topics, especially during descriptions. So did you feel he had a rebellious, maybe a positive note of rebellion within his writing? I'd like to answer that one, if I may. Why do you say Pakistani people? Sorry? No, you're right. Unrealistic to be shy away from it. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. It would be very unrealistic to be shy away from it. I mean, he is very much a product of the Zia years. Oh, yes, I agree in with Pakistan, that. In Pakistan, that would only happen in Pakistan. 1947, 1971, 1980s in Karachi, uh, uh, January, 1990s in Karachi. Pakistan, thank you. Oh. Oh, yes, I agree with that, but mostly people uh, at that time did not address these issues. Oh, that's why you're telling me the, uh, the truth, that Pakistan is shy away from reality. Sorry, this, this man wrote surrealism, but it was realism. It grew from reality. No, I don't, think it's, I, I don't think it's a rebellion. Um, there are two things. For one thing, he had experienced this and he was aware of this. Um, who is he rebelling against? He's, he's left in Pakistan, I don't know, he left Pakistan about 1974. So he's gone to England. Um, he's not re rebelling against the standards of Pakistan because they no longer particularly apply to him and his novels hardly uh, come here. So I, I don't think it's rebellion, but I think the rebellion, yes, is, is in your perception of the world that is not as great as you think it is. I don't think it's a specifically Pakistani rebellion. I think it is a it is a protest against the unfairness of this world, which I think is quite right. Uh, I think the protest is the correct word, not rebellion. I don't think living in England, in this kind of writing and the kinds of no, subject matter he chose for his novels is particularly rebellious. Not I at think, all. Not, I mean, not really rebellious at all. It rebellious in the context of contemporary Pakistan and actually only, I think, for your generation because your generation are G Zia's children. Um, in a sense, or those of us who grew up before Zia um, have a very different sense of the what is permissible in literature, what is permissible in writing, and what we see around us. Um, uh, and I, we have to end um, uh, because our time is up. But, but I think part of the issue is that your generation just needs to read a lot more, and consistently, and every day. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the lecture, but... <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, I'm sorry. OUP said that my books are in sale. Uh, they told me to tell you that the books were on sale. This, so if you want anything signed, I, I should be floating around there.